It's the Canusa Sports Desk on the 405 Radio. Good morning. It is 8 o'clock. It's early on the West Coast, but it is 11 a.m. on the East Coast, and that means it's time for Derek Marquez, Frank Nutt, and our guest for today. Uh, we have a toll-free phone line. It is 877-297-8022. Uh, we got a bunch of social media stuff going on here, so keep track of this. If you want to reach us on Twitter, it's at SD. If you want to check out the podcasts and the blogs and everything else going on, check out CanusaSD.com. Or we've also got a bunch of podcasts from the previous shows sitting up on iTunes as well. Uh, so take a look at those when you get a chance. So if you are listening to the podcast version of the show, make sure to catch us live every Saturday morning here on the 405 Radio. Uh, so let us say good morning to uh, Derek Marquez, blogger, uh, Toronto Blue Jays fan, sports writer from Toronto, Ontario. Good morning, Derek. Good morning, John. And Frank Nutt is our hoops guy. Uh, he is watching, I'm sure, the uh, NCAA March Madness and going over everything with a fine-tooth comb. We'll have a report from him later. Uh, good morning, Frank. <laughs> good morning, John. Our guest is Marcus Pfizer. He was born in Inkster, Michigan, and I don't know where that is. He played high school basketball at Arcadia High School in Arcadia, Louisiana. As a senior, Pfizer was selected to play in the McDonald's All-American game. After high school, Pfizer took his talents to play at Iowa State University. He has a very solid career at Iowa State and gained a lot of popularity while being there. Once his career was done at Iowa State, he went to the NBA draft, and he was selected fourth overall in the 2000 NBA draft by the Chicago Bulls. He played four full seasons with the Bulls, and he has also had stops in Milwaukee with the Bucks, New Orleans with the Hornets. In 2006, he played in the NBA D-League and won the NBA D-League MVP. Once that season was over, Marcus decided to play basketball overseas. He's played in Spain. Puerto Rico, Israel, Russia, Taiwan, and most recently, Argentina. Uh, so, Marcus Pfizer, uh, good morning, and, and thanks for joining us today. Good morning, John. Glad, glad to be here. Thanks yeah. Here. Take it away, Derek. So, Marcus, again, uh, thanks for coming on. First question we have for you, you know, let uh, the listeners know what kind of ball player Marcus Pfizer is, if they're not uh, familiar with your game. Um, well, the, the, what kind of ball player I am, I'm, I'm a very focused uh, basketball player. When, when I'm playing basketball... I uh, tend to to try to focus on nothing but that. I I'm not thinking about the fans. I'm not thinking about my wife and kids. I'm not thinking about anything but what my coach has to say and um, my teammates. Um, that's that's the only way I know how to play. Because if I if I tend to think about outside things, then my level of play comes down. Um, I've been compared to um, being the uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde type guy where. You know, people who know me off the court, they say I, I'm a totally different guy off the court than than the way I look on the court. They say I always look mean and menacing, and this is just the way I have to play. I have to just try to stay as focused as I can. Um, I'm really not having fun on the court until uh, the ball, the basketball game is about over and, and my team is about to win, and that's when I can really relax. But until then, uh, I'm just focused on nothing but win. And, and sometimes it comes across as... Uh, me being mean or me being upset, but this is just totally not the way I am. I'm, I'm just a guy that's, that tries to keep focused this, um, for the entire game. So it is uh, March. March Madness is upon us, and you know we're into uh, the Elite Eight. Wondering, you had a lucrative career at Iowa State. What's your best memory of the uh -huh. tournament when you played, or your best memory at Iowa State? Um, the best memories of the tournament, um, I have bittersweet memories from, from the NCAA tournament, uh, obviously, but um, we, we had a great run. We, we had fun. Um, I, just, I just remember the guys when, when I was there. 
uh, being up on the coaching station and the coaching staff there, playing with uh, Jamal Tinsley and Mike Nurse and uh, Stevie Johnson, uh, a couple of guys, uh, Martin Rancid, Martin Rancid, excuse me, Paul Shirley, you know, some a couple of other guys who played uh, professional basketball uh, abroad and, and and things like that. But um, you know, we, we had a great run. We we just focused on uh, you know winning ball games. Uh, I can remember in, in the beginning of the year when we began training uh, in early September, uh, early October, just seeing the uh, the championship trophy and and knowing that the uh, the Final Four was going to be in Indianapolis and, and wanting to get there and to hold that trophy. That's what I focused on. And uh, we played extremely hard. We made a big run, and uh, it, it was very disappointing to have that, um, you know, come to an end uh, in, in Detroit against, you know, who was eventually the national champs. And um, But, you know, to, to, to say, you know, it, it, it all went by really, really fast. Um you know, basketball in college was fun. I can remember beating Kansas and, and, you know, just being so focused on, on the fact that we were having fun as a group, you know, as a, as a, as a team. And uh, I remember Coach Roy Williams was trying to congratulate me at the end of uh, one of the games where we beat them. And I, I really wasn't paying attention to him because I was so caught up in the fact of, you know, how big that win was for Iowa State. And, um, and eventually, I, I he got my attention, and, and I humbled myself and listened to the things that he had to say. But as soon as that, that time was over, I went right back to celebrating with my teammates. Very cool, very cool. So, Marcus, this is Frank. How you doing? Good morning. Um, I just wanted to jump back a little bit, a little bit uh, further in your career, um, back to your days before Iowa State. Um, John John had stated that you played in the McDonald's All American game with guys like you know Baron Davis, Ron Artest, Shane Battier, Elton Brand, uh-huh. um, and then you know Tracy McGrady, Lamar Odom, just to name a few. Uh, kind of take us, kind of take the listeners through that that process and and that you know that weekend or that week that you spent uh, with those players. Um, well, being from from Louisiana, a smaller town in Louisiana, you, you know, guys really does don't get as much recognition as as the uh, northern states or the big bigger city guys. Um, you know, I, once I got drafted by the Bulls, a lot of the uh, sports writers were asking me about you know getting to know the guys, getting to know Ron Artest, Elton Brand, you know, guys like Lamar Odom, Tracy McGrady, and Alex. You know, I told them, you know, once you become I guess you would say stars or elite athletes in high school, all the time in the summer you're playing against those guys. So we had known each other since we were, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old. Uh, we just didn't play basketball against each other during high school, but during the AAU tournaments and the uh, All-American tournaments and Nike camps and things like that, we were always in the same place. So we we, we had known each other for, for so long. Um, but to be to be selected as a, as a McDonald's All American was was definitely a, an honor. Uh, it was one that caught me by total surprise. Although I knew, you know, the kind of talent that I was and uh, what kind of player I was in high school and everything. But it was it was a total surprise because you you always uh, you always notice the guys, you know, either from California or from New York or from the northern states or maybe Florida is, is getting picked. You know, you don't see a lot of small town guys like you know Arcadia, Louisiana uh, guys being selected. So. You know, that weekend went by extremely fast. We were in Colorado Springs, you know. Um, it's not much you can remember about Colorado Springs, you know, <laughs> during the winter. <laughs> you yeah. know, I just remember Some sitting snow. here with my parents and my family and, and, and spending time with them, the banquet, uh, laughing with my family and my little brothers uh, during that time. But, you know, the, the, the week went by extremely fast, and it, it, was, it was great to be there. It was great to play in the game and uh, to move on to Iowa State. Yeah, very cool. So now kind of take us through the, the recruiting process a little bit. Um, I know, I, I mean, I don't know if, if this was true back in uh, 97, 98, um, you know, when you were coming out of high school, but Iowa State has gained a little bit of a reputation. Um, you know, they've, they've been under question a few times in the past, uh, you know, a couple of years with, with recruiting and some, you know, some infractions while recruiting. Did you experience any of that being recruited by Iowa State or by any other school, um, you know, during um, your recruitment process? I, I definitely experienced um, some of those things, you know, from, from some schools. I can honestly say um, where I am now, being the man that I am now, um, that none of that ever came across from Iowa State. Um, 
you know, I, I knew that I was I was a McDonald All American. I, I don't know if I'm still the only McDonald All American ever to go to Iowa State, but you know, you hear all of the stories about you know All Americans going to school and you know NCA you know violations and guys getting this and guys getting that. But I can remember walking to uh, practice in the middle of my sophomore year, which my dorm was directly across the street from the Hilton Coliseum. But you know, in in, in the forty uh, inch snow blizzard that was happening at the time, you couldn't even see the Coliseum. And I, I can I remember walking, you know, because our coaches wouldn't even give us a ride because that was even a, a violation. Yeah, they literally yeah. would not give us a ride from 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 the dorms to practice. And I can remember walking across the street, um, doing that snow and saying to myself, you know what, if I came to a university to get something. I came to the wrong university. <laughs> and so that, that really gave me that much more drive to understanding how special everything was. And, and you know, being at Iowa State, and, and like you said, it, it, there's been things that, that came about, but I can honestly say, you know, they, they've been the cleanest university that I've ever been involved with uh, or known about. Um, you know, when I was recruited by them, you know, I, I knew from my freshman year in high school that I was going to Iowa State. Uh, because of the fact that um, my mother was working um, at a, a retirement um, a rehabilitation center or a retirement home in Louisiana, in Arcade, Louisiana. And uh, Coach Floyd's wife's uh, mother was um, in that ret- retirement center. And so I met Beverly Floyd there, and, and she had, you know, just an Iowa State um, media guy. And from that moment, she handed it to me, and I, and I read it, and I just remembered. From that point on, just following Coach Floyd, watching the things that Digital Willoughby and Kenny Pratt and, uh, you know, those guys were doing at the time. They were still in the Big 8 there. And I just fell in love with Iowa State. And uh, hmm. as my basketball career began to grow, uh, my because I, I couldn't play basketball my freshman year in high school because I moved from Louisiana, to uh, I mean, from Detroit to Louisiana. And so I had to sit out my freshman year. But my sophomore, my junior, my senior year, I just remember just being so in love with Iowa State, just going to somewhere to, to make my mark. I, I didn't want to go to Duke. Uh, I remember being in, in, in the gym shooting around, and my high school coach calling me into the office. And, you know, it was a big thing for them to, to announce over the, the PA system, you know, that uh, Coach K was calling on the phone, and, and uh, Coach John Thompson from uh, Georgetown was calling on the phone. And, and I forget who the coach was at, at Kentucky at the time, but, I just, I just remember telling them that I didn't want to go to those schools. I wanted to go to somewhere where I could be, you know, uh, something to, to start a tradition. And I think, you know, me and, and the guys at Iowa State, you know, following behind, you know, like I said, Fred Hoiberg and Deidre Willoughby and those guys, I think we, we, we started a way that, you know, makes a lot of guys look at Iowa State a lot differently now. So, Marcus, um, I have a question to ask you. I don't know if I'll ever have an opportunity to ask uh, someone like this um, this question. What was it like to be a lottery pick, fourth overall in the NBA draft? That whole experience, I've seen many of them on TV putting the cap on. What was it like to be there in person and being, you know, a top five NBA pick? Um, it, it was definitely a blessing, you know, to, to know that your, your hard work and your focusedness and, you know, that pinnacle point had, had been reached. Um Honestly, I, I never assumed that I was going to be drafted by the Bulls with the uh, own brand being taken the year before me, the exact same you know position and things of that nature. Um, the rumors were I was going to either number three to the Clippers or number four to I mean number five to Orlando, and that's you know what me and my uh, agent was preparing for. Um, Coach Floyd was a coach at the Bulls at the time, and, and you know I, I totally welcomed the fact of, of being reunited with him at, uh, in Chicago. But it, it was something that I never, you know, thought that w- that was going to take place. But when the moment came, you know, it, it was definitely a, a blessing and a happy moment in my life, a happy moment for you know me and my family, and um, it's something that I, I wish you know every you know basketball player has, has the experience to to be a part of. I, mean, I know that's, you know, kind of realistic, but, you know, that's, those are the moments that you live your life for. And I have two sons that's growing up behind me uh, that I'm raising, one that's 15 and one that's 9 years old that, you know, definitely has the possibility of, of becoming pros. And even, you know, I have a 4-year-old daughter who's, 
you know, a phenom athlete as well that, you know, you got the WNBA around now. And so uh, maybe in the years coming, she'll be able to experience something like that. So I'm looking forward to it. So definitely an awesome experience for you, I'm sure, of, of you know, being a no fourth overall pick. Now, when, looking back now, you know, 15 plus years ago or whenever, uh, 13 years ago, um, do you think that being taken by the Bulls, do you ever regret that? Because, you know, obviously Elton Brand was there. I know, you know, the, the relationship that you had with Tim Floyd, I'm, you know, I'm sure was a positive one. And that's definitely something you, you liked going to the I, Bulls. I, but do you, would I, you ever think of maybe what ha- would have happened if you went fifth um, or I, I sixth? Think I, 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 will be, I will be lying to, to say that I don't. I'll be lying to say that I, that I had it all of that, you know, over my career. Um, you know, like, like you said, you know, it, it was kind of a, a, a tough situation. I, I was young. I was 21 years old. I, all I was thinking about is, I, you know, I'm such a different player now where, where I'm older, I understand the game more. I understand the things that, you know, Charles Oakley and Scotty Pippen and Antonio Davis and those guys like that was trying to teach me. Now, um, the downside of that is I wasn't trying to listen to them at that age, uh, yeah. 21, 22, 23 years old. I was, I was so focused on, you know, trying to beat out Hill, you know, or trying to beat out the next year, you know, Eddie Curry and Tyson Chandler coming in. Yep, I, was, yep. I was focused on the whole, whole hoopla of, of being the star power forward. Not understanding that the trust system and the belief that, you know, uh, Tim Floyd had in me and Bill Cartwright had in me and, and understanding that I was, Finishing games, them trying to tell me that that was more important than starting the game, like I said, as a 21, 22, 23-year-old, I wasn't trying to listen and try, trying to understand that. And all I could think about was, you know, man, you know, I, I should have won number three to the Clippers. I should have won number four or, uh, or number five or number six to uh, Orlando. You know, yeah. uh, Doc Williams was a coach in Orlando at the time. And, you know, Doc and I had a great relationship, and he used to joke with me all the time and say, you know, the Bulls took you one pick too early. And it wasn't about a money thing, you know. I know there's a money difference, but it's not that big of a money No, difference. yeah, it's not that big it's of a four difference. Four to five. But I, I, I just was focused on the wrong thing. I was enamored about the the wrong things in life. I was, I was thinking about, you know, being a you know a young kid, an instant millionaire in the middle of Chicago. And, and, you know, those things caught up to me because I wouldn't train the way I should have trained. Uh, you know, I was, I was so athletic, I was so big, and I was so strong, and I and I thought my talent would take me so much further than, you know, anything else. So, like I said, I, I didn't pay attention to the things that I, I should have been paying attention to. I, sh- I didn't focus on the things that I should have focused on. Um, and, you know, during my career, there's been a lot, a lot of ups and downs and a lot of heartaches and things like that. But, you know, I'm 34 years old now. It's, I'm, I still got a lot of basketball to, to play uh, a lot of basketball left in me because I really hadn't played in the last three, three and a half, four years. And so God took me through this whole whole process of, of humbling myself and, and taking me to a place where I understand why I went wrong. You know, if you can, if, if you've been through anything in your life and you understand the problem and, and how you got to where you are, then that's a, that's a learning process. So if, you, if you just remain stupid, not even ignorant, if you remain stupid about, you know, things that you've been through and you don't learn and build from it, then that's your own fault. So, Marcus, you know, just to uh, let you know that if I had any pull, and if you're still around at 21 when the Raptors picked, I would have had them pick you instead of Morris <laughs> Peterson. You know, just to let you know that if I had that pull, you know, I would, I would tell uh, the Raptors to, to, give, to give you a shot over Morris Peterson, over, over uh, um, well, Mo well, Pete well, went well, to being well, the longest uh, playing Raptor, but, you know, I think you had a great career up in Toronto. Yeah, Mo, Mo, Mo had a good, good career. I, I wasn't a real Mo, Morris Peterson fan, obviously, when we came out in 2000, because him and Machine got, got my ring on their finger right now somewhere. So, <laughs> yeah, um, yep. But, but yeah, we, you know, Morris had, had a good career up in, in Toronto. And uh, Toronto has always been a fun season. I mean, excuse me, a, a fun city to visit. Um, you know, one of, one of the guys that's in WCM now, Liam McMorrow, who's a, a, a seven seven two, you know, 270-pound guy. He played with Iowa Energy uh, at the beginning of, of the season last year, and now he's here with us in Vegas training and working out with uh, Impact Sports, who's looking to, to make that break in into the NBA. 
Um, he's from Toronto, and, and you know, he, we're always we're always talking about you know the things in Toronto and and uh, him growing up there, and you know, just just remembering Toronto was one of my favorite cities. One of the cities I probably was doing things that I had no business. You know, probably should have been you know somewhere trying to get my rest and and, and not trying to hang out and and go to parties as Marcus Fires, but. You know, it's always been a fun city, and, and, and I probably would have loved playing it. Good stuff. Right, so one last question before we go to break. Um, was there any unique uh, endorsements that you got out of being a lottery pick? Um, just, I guess you say, nothing is extravagant. I mean, I, I got the upper deck deals, and um, I got, you know, a couple shoe deals and things like that, and, um, you know, Nike apparel and stuff like that. But, you know, I wasn't you know, the, the franchise type player where, you know, you have guys signing uh, $100 million shoe deals and stuff like that. I wasn't fortunate enough to get that. <laughs> but yeah, for sure. Course, you know, every, every once in a while here and there. Yeah, so, you know, um, Marcus, when we, when we come back from break, we want to get your uh, your thoughts on the NCAA tournament, um, you know, and, and, and what you think so far and how your bracket's doing um, and, and how uh, – how Derek and, and Frank's brackets are doing, because I can tell you for sure that uh, that my bracket's not so good. So uh, right here when we come back, we'll talk some NCAA hoops. 877-297-8022. Coming right back with the Canusa Sports Desk on the 405 Radio. 405. NASCAR is one of the world's most popular sporting events. With more than 75 million fans, it's the number two sport on television. And more Fortune 500 companies participate in NASCAR than in any other sport. Preparation before a race can impact who wins. Crew members put in hours of fine-tuning and analysis to eliminate problems that are obstacles to the team's success. I'm Kevin Harvick. As a NASCAR driver, I know all about regular checkups and early detection to prevent problems. It makes sense to do the same with your health and have regular checkups for prostate cancer. Every man over the age of 50 should resolve to be screened annually for prostate cancer as the lifetime risk of developing prostate cancer is one in six men. Put the odds in your favor and commit to being screened annually. Hi, I'm Gavin DeGraw for RAD, recording artists, actors, and athletes against drunk driving. In less time than it takes to play your favorite tune, someone will be killed or injured in an alcohol-related crash. If you party, plan ahead. Designate before you celebrate. Sad stories make great songs, but happy endings make better lives. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. A public service message brought to you by the U.S. Department of Transportation, RAD, the National Association of Broadcasters, and the Ad Council. Here at the 405, we've got the cure for the Mondays. Does anyone ever say to you, sounds like someone has a case of the Mondays? No, man. I believe you get your ass kicked saying so much, man. Fridays. Next Friday is Hawaiian Shirt Day. Sundays. I'm also going to need you to go ahead and come in on Sunday. You'll feel better. Oh, oh, oh. You know what I'm talking about. And be a better person. I have people skills. What the hell is wrong with you people? Make the 405 a... Uh, I believe you have my stapler. Staple of your week. Yeah. You're on the 405. Hello again, everybody. Harry Carey from Rigby Field on a beautiful day for baseball. It's the Canusa Sports Desk on the 405 Radio. And here's a Marcus Pfizer blast from the past. Bounce pass to Pfizer. Good patience. Now he'll take it in. Oh! Indiana State finishes the season number three in the nation after losing against Michigan State in a controversial game in the year 2000. So we'll send it back to Derek and Frank. I thought I'd surprise you guys with that. <laughs> so do you remember that game, uh, Marcus? What, what was that? I, I really can hear. Was that over? Was that the Texas basketball game? Yeah, that was the uh, dunk over Chris Mim. Chris Mime. I, I, yeah, Chris, Chris Mim. Mim I, I, I knew that was a, <laughs> was, it was a highlight that was being played. Uh, that's, that's one of the one of the all time favorites of uh, Iowa State fans and, and everyone in up in Ames. Uh, to me personally, I it, it was just a flash. It was it was it was the the, the focusness of going into the NCAA tournament, and you know I can remember 
kind of now everybody being, you know, in an uproar or this scoring tier that I was on, I think in, in six, seven games, I averaged like 35 points. But I wasn't thinking about that. All I was thinking about was winning the trophy and getting to the tournament. And things went by so fast during that time that, you know, I wasn't thinking about nothing but winning. So um, we're in the Elite Eight. I um, just kind of want to recap what uh, you thought of the uh, Sweet 16 matches there, uh, Marcus. You know, was there any surprise? You know, Wichita State's still in it, uh, but uh, Florida Gulf Coast, uh, you know, their Cinderella slipper has broke uh, last night against uh, Florida. What's your take on uh, the Sweet 16 matches that happened over the past two days? Well, there's, there's definitely been some surprises in the NCAA tournament this year. Um, Wichita State... You know, it, it, the Shockers, I absolutely love the, the, the name, the Shockers. I, I played with a guy in Argentina at <laughs> uh, the, the beginning of the year last year, um, uh, Jonathan uh, Durley. He went to uh, Wichita State. And um, another guy that's a good friend of mine, R- Ramon Clemente, he, play, he plays professionally over in, in Israel. And so you can see on Facebook all night long, they just continue to post, post, post. And, uh I think Wichita State is, is really making a name uh, for themselves, and, and, and they're doing extremely well. Uh, uh, Florida Gulf Coast, you know, they just came out of nowhere. Um, you know, that's that feel-good story that, that really gives you goosebumps to, to see guys, you know, being focused on, you know, playing basketball against the, the quote-unquote the Goliaths. And, and I can remember when I was in school, you know, playing against Kansas and playing against uh, Texas and uh, Oklahoma State and, and things of that nature. And, and uh, people saying Iowa State, yeah, Iowa State is going to win the, you know, the conference tournament. We're going to win the conference. You know, we, we want to be, you know, that, you know, uh, that uh, so on someone's side, that, you know, that thorn that's going to stick out. And um, it, it just makes me feel feel good to to, to root for the underdogs. Um, to see to see Michigan come back last night. I I was born and raised in, in Detroit, Michigan. You know, someone said they didn't didn't know what Inkster is, is in Michigan. It's it's a couple miles away from Detroit. But I was born and raised originally in Detroit, Michigan and and I never wanted to go to Michigan, University of Michigan, although it was my favorite school growing up. Um it, it was just too close to home. Uh, but to, to, to still root for them now that Iowa State is out of the tournament and to see them have that incredible comeback last night. I was flipping in between channels, and, you know, um, before I got back to the channel, I, I was watching the, the other game that was on, I looked at the top, and I saw the Michigan had won, and I was so upset about the fact that I missed, you know, uh, what Trey Bird did and the rest of those guys. Um, been in the NBA, uh, you know, years about 10 years ago, I can remember uh, Tim Hardaway Jr. You know, Tim, was a, he was a little big boy. Little boy, and now he's a grown man. He's he's in college and playing extremely well. And I stepped and looked at him, and I said, "My goodness, you know how fast time has passed." And you know now they're they're in college, having the fun that we had. And you know uh, that that I tell people all the time. That's when basketball was really fun. Now it's it's, it's a job. It's it's a focusness and uh, it's a business, and it's really political. But uh, college basketball was was the last time basketball was extremely fun. <laughs> and, and you know what, Marcus, if, if you want to feel even older, um, I've always been a huge NBA fan. Uh, I've always followed the Bulls. I remember when you were drafted, and when you were drafted, I was 12 years old. So, um, oh, my God. <laughs> so if that, if that makes you feel... That's kind of like Blake Griffin. I, I say to myself, my goodness, these guys were like kids when yeah. you know, we, were, we were drafted. And, and I, can, I, can, I, can remember, I can remember, I tell this story all the time, this funny story. Um, we got on the we got on the plane. We were flying somewhere, and and Jalen Rose, you know, has always been you know one of my favorite players, and you know, was a great friend of mine. And I looked looked up to him when, when we played together in Chicago. And the great dresser. So we got on, and, 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 and the so snazziest the dresser in the NBA. <laughs> well, well, he 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 had, he had the money in his pocket to dress his team new well. <laughs> but uh, we was on the plane. He was just he was just staring. Just staring, just staring, and I literally, you know, I was a young guy looking at, you know, one of my, you know, mentors or whatever, and, and I would look at him for for a complete twenty minutes, twenty minutes, and so I got up and went over to where he was, and and I tapped him. And I was like, Jay Rose, man, what's going on? What's going on? He said, You know what? I'd have messed around and got up, and I just. 
fell out laughing. I, I mean, for about 30 <laughs> minutes, I just could not stop laughing. I said, that's what you sitting up here saying? He's like, you know, I'm just sitting up here thinking. And all y'all young fellas coming into the league, I done messed around and got over. And he was maybe, what, 29, 30 years old at the time. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and, and, you know, here I am, 34 years old now. And, and I think about that from time to time. And I just I just still die inside from, from thinking about that moment. Yeah, so, I mean, to kind of jump back to the NCAA tournament a little bit, um, you know, to me, I, I did have the chance to watch most of these games. Uh, there were some that I, I, didn't, I watched more than others, obviously. Um, I thought the Miami-Marquette game, Marquette was definitely helped by the fact that Reggie Jackson um, couldn't play the best rebounder um, for Miami, couldn't play against one of the top rebounding con- teams in the country. So I thought that really helped Marquette. Um, and then the Indiana-Syracuse game was really puzzling to me because I thought that you know, with a couple days to prepare for that Syracuse zone, they did. Uh, Indiana did a very poor job moving the ball and changing the side of the floor that the ball was on. And I really thought that they, knowing that that Syracuse is going to trap in that short corner, uh, like they have, you know, pretty much all year and throughout the history of Jim Beheim running that two three zone, they stuck their best player in the short corner for the majority of their offensive possessions. And I I understand, you know wanting to move him from the short corner to the high post. I felt like, you know, I, I just I felt like Zeller should have been in the high post the entire game, you know, sticking a playmaker, somebody that can shoot there. Um, you know, and, and Indiana never really did it. So I I felt like Oladipo, you know, didn't have much help. Guys really weren't making plays and then Syracuse with that athleticism in that zone really took over that game. And I it was it was, the the score indicates much closer than I thought that was. I thought Syracuse had a stronghold in that game uh, throughout. And then just a little bit of a personal story, Wichita State, um, the sixth man off the bench, he actually started against LaSalle. Um, Clay Anthony Early actually plays for the program. Uh, he played AAU for the program that I now coach for. Um, and I, he played at a rival high school. Um, he's only a year younger than me. Uh, but he went to prep school and, and junior college, so he's got a couple years of eligibility that I don't have anymore. Um, but he's, you know, great story. I think he's an NBA prospect. He's got the body, 6'8", uh, 230, you know, can, can put the ball on the floor a little bit. He's got to improve his dribbling, but he can shoot, and he can rise and dunk over just about anybody. And I think Wichita State's been a huge story. Um, the fact that they got to play LaSalle, you know, really helps them, especially moving forward. I'm really interested to see what they do against Ohio State in the next round. I'm, I'm actually I'm pulling for them. The Shockers are probably the best story left now. Um, and then, hey, as far as the best game, no, oh, yeah, as as far as the best game this week so far to me, I really thought it was last night Michigan over Kansas game. I, I remember checking the score. I actually had Kansas to win it all, and I saw they were up by like 13 with like a couple minutes left, and I was like, oh, cool, this one's in the bag. So I turned it, um, you know, to another game that was going on, and. I, all of a sudden, I turn back and it's an overtime. And and Trey Burke, you know, arguably, you know, a top ten lottery pick, probably I would say, um, you know, just took over that game. And and after having such a subpar first half, came back with twenty three points in the second half and willed, really willed that team to victory. You know, Glenn Robinson Jr. also had a great game. And and Marcus, like you said before, Tim Hardaway Jr. just continues to impress. You know, every time I see him play. So I definitely think that Michigan. Now, after beating Kansas, you know, they'll play Florida uh, on Sunday, I believe. And, you know, I, I look for them to do big things against that Florida team. It was, it was pretty physical with some, some really good guard play on the, on the, on the perimeter as well. Uh, Derek, what, did you, what do you think about the games uh, so far this weekend? Um, I only caught a few of them. I did catch the, um, the Florida, Florida Gulf Coast game, and, you know, Florida Gulf Coast came out ready. But, you know, from, they just went that 16-2 run at the end of the first half. Killed oh, yeah, them. Was killer. It and it just they just started the second half the same way. They just kind of further and further behind. They just fell behind it. I was impressed with um, Florida stat where you know they're zero and six in games decided by under ten points yeah. and like twenty was it twenty six and zero. So either they run teams out. So I'll be interested to watch that Florida Michigan game to yeah, see how that's going to go. That's the game I'm going to look forward to. And I did catch the um, Indiana uh, Syracuse game, and I thought Syracuse just pressuring them. Indiana looked ugly. Uh, you know they just couldn't get anything going. And for someone who had India going down, Indiana going to the final two, you know, I was pulling for them. It was just it was frustrating to watch because they couldn't get anything. There's just that pressure and just the, you know, the Coach Beheim just milking the clock just really drains the excitement out of a game, um, in my opinion. <laughs> good, good coaching. Good coaching. Marcus, what do you, what do you think about previewing some of these Elite Eight games? What game, 
What game are you looking forward to uh, most today and then tomorrow? Well, I, I, I really, you know, don't don't try to be too biased or, or, or to go for, you know, any one team. I just love seeing good basketball games. Um, I just love re- reliving a moment and, and remembering um, – the times when I was there and, and playing in college basketball, it's, it's extremely fun to watch. I tell people that all the time, even in different sports. Um, if it's basketball, football, uh, in, in NFL, NHL, MLB, or whatever, I just like seeing great competitive games. You can you can see me at you know a basketball game, and I'd be cheering for you know both squads, or you know telling this guy to do this, or you know take that shot, young fellow, or you know. In the trade here and there, that's a good shot. And, and, and my son's like, who, who are you going for? And I'm like, I'm not going for anybody. I just like seeing, you know, great competitive good games. I, I love seeing great action. And, you know, just to see good close games and, and, and guys playing their heart out, you know, that's, that's what I live for. So moving to the NBA, I must say, thank goodness the streak is over. Um, if I had to hear more <laughs> about Miami Heat and their streak one more time on any media outlet being in Canada or – in the states, it was just getting too much. I'm so glad. thank you, Marcus Pfizer, as a former Chicago Bull alumni, that your Bulls have beat them. <laughs> we can now stop sure. hearing about the streak. You know how LeBron had Cheerios for breakfast and how there he's undefeated. Just get this over with. You know what's your take of that game, and will this be kind of um, you know something to build on if these two teams play in the playoffs? Uh, I think the Bulls. You know, my the hat goes off to them. Uh, there's no question about that. I think they play uh, extremely well, uh, a focused game. You know, Coach Thibodeau got them extremely uh, prepared for that game, and then they came out and they played with a lot of heart and determination. Uh, Carlos had a, a huge game, and, and I was, I know he was glad to to be able to uh, come out and and get that victory over the, the streak in Miami Heat. Uh, well, me personally, I, I love to see records broken. You know, records are made to be broken, and I was, you know, definitely rooting for them to at least get to the point of, of being able to have the chance to win. Uh, I'm the I'm the guy that, you know, I, I love game seven. You know, when 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 the series is tied six six, you know, either win the championship or go home and and lose. So, I was looking forward to them getting to the point of uh being able to uh, challenge that record. They 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 made a great run. They made. Uh, you know, uh, a record that is probably going to be standing for a long time. Um, so to to be able to lose that game and the Bulls be able to, to, to pull out the victory, maybe that's a good thing for Miami. Uh, maybe those guys are, you know, they played last night and, and from what I heard, just totally demolished the Hornets. You know, and they, they probably yeah. wasn't going to do that anyways, you know, if they would have beat the Bulls. But, you know, uh, I think D. Wade said it, you know, that's uh, about being able to focus on, you know, the rest of the season. And they're 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 not if they would have broken the uh, all time uh, winning record streak and, and not win the NBA championship, then you know what does that streak stand for? Yeah, no, that's that's a really good point, Marcus. And and you know, I I somewhat agree. I mean, I'm a little biased because I'm a Knicks fan, so uh-huh. I would have loved to see them bring that streak. Um, you know, Tuesday night to play the Knicks, and then the Knicks. Riding a nine game or an eight game win streak going into that game, uh, I think it's I think it's funny. Uh, you know, two weeks ago I was about ready to jump, sh- you know, jump off the the Newburgh Beacon Bridge <laughs> because you know the Knicks had lost four in a row, about to lose five in a row, and now all of a sudden they rattle off seven in a row. Uh, so to me, uh-huh. it's you know I would have loved to see them play them with both streaks on the line. Uh, you know, regardless of of how meaningless the Knicks is right now, um, and you know how meaningful that that. Um, Miami Heat streak would be, but to me, I, I just love it because right now is such a lull in the NBA season. You know, right before the playoff talk, talk really starts to pick up, right after the NBA trade deadline and All Star Weekend is passed. I mean, it's really a lull in the NBA season for players, um, you uh-huh. know, and for fans. And I think it's a great thing. It kept people, you know, oh, did Miami win last night? Like, yes, it was a little bit overkill knowing what LeBron and D Wade had eaten for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day, but. I think as a you know a casual NBA fan, I had people asking me, you know, people I work with or people you know who I went to to college with and played basketball with, you know, oh, you know, do you, what do you think they're going to do? Who do you think they're going to lose against? And you know, it's it's just it's a cool spark to a, a lull in the NBA season. And, and Marcus, you might be able to attest to this a little bit playing in the NBA. You know, are the dog days of March, you know, in the NBA right before the playoffs are you know are about to start and after the All Star break? Is that the 
the toughest time to stay focused uh, as an NBA player on the task at hand, not looking forward, looking ahead to the playoffs or, you know, possibly, you know, needing that break after the All-Star break? Well, I, I think once you guys get to the All-Star break, the All-Star break comes at, at, at a moment where uh, guys really need it. Um, a lot of guys get re-energized after, after that time. Um, after, after the All-Star break is when things really start heating up and teams begin to go on, like your New York Knicks, the, the, the six, seven, eight game winning streaks because they know how important it is. Um, uh, to sneak in and, and, and get a couple wins uh, against a team that, that's probably, you know, not as focused as they should be. Um, that, uh, this is the time that really matters. To get out of to get out of the position or, or the seating of, of, of running into, you know, maybe a powerhouse Miami or something like that goes a long way because, you know, once the playoff starts, you know, anything can happen. We, we saw that a couple years ago with, with Memphis and uh, San Antonio. You know, those guys played extremely well once the playoffs began, and, you know, uh, they took San Antonio out. So, at this at this point in time, you have some teams and some players like, you know, J.R. Smith is, is just Love him right now. He's, he, he's, he's playing phenomenal, and, and, you know, everyone in New York is loving him right now. At, at times, <laughs> he, he, can't, he tends to get a little erratic, whatever, but I've always been a J.R. Smith fan. We, we played together uh, for the Hornets. You know, he wasn't yep, starting, yep. and in her, he was going off the career. bench, and we were in practice, and I can just remember me, him, and, and Brandon Bass, and some of those other guys, uh, just giving, you know, the starters the business, you know, and it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. But he's, he's playing extremely well right now. New York New York is doing well, and a lot of other teams are, are doing things, big things in uh, the NBA, and they're looking forward to, to, to the playoffs coming around really soon. It's time for another uh, commercial break, but come back and you'll hear uh, myself talk about the Jerome McGinley trade to the Pittsburgh Penguins and also the upcoming NBA, sorry, NFL, uh, NHL trade deadline. 877-297-8022, back in a flash with the final segment of the Canusa Sports Desk on the 405 Radio. Whoa, a new digital music player. Thanks, Mom. Oh, I'm glad you like it, because I can't wait to toss the big stereo. And now that we got your dad that big HD TV he wanted, we can throw out our old TV, too. Hold up. You can't just throw out electronics. Really? They need to be recycled or donated. And how would we do that? <laughs> it's so easy, Mom. Today, recycling electronics is just as easy as buying them. GreenerGadgets.org has all the info. We just enter our zip code to find a certified recycling center nearby. There are thousands of them, and new ones are being added all the time. Some of our local stores are even certified recycling locations. I like that. Did you know that some of the stuff in our old electronics could be used to make new products and conserve natural resources? Well, okay then. Let's gather them up. Um, what was that website again? GreenerGadgets.org. We just enter our zip code and go. Research shows that over 99% of Americans are not at their ideal heart health. Hey, Mikey, did you know exercise will lower your risk of heart disease? Yes, DW, and we look better than ever. <laughs> Let's win this thing, boys. I've got to get to my regular checkup. Mike, this is actually a pretty big race. I I'm starting to get a little nervous. Nervous? You need to relax, Larry and Max. Stress is bad for you. Visit heart.org slash Fox Sports for simple steps to a better, healthier life. Hey, what's up? This is Cliff speaking for Rad. Give up the keys, choose a designated driver. Music lives, so should you. A public service message brought to you by the U.S. Department of Transportation, Rad, the National Association of Broadcasters, and the Ad Council. Just a bit outside. It's the closing segment of the Canusa Sports Desk on the 405 Radio. We got time for a phone call, so pick up the phone and call 877-297-8022, and let's send it back to Derek Marquez. So before I get into some NHL talk with the trade deadline coming up, I do want to give a shout-out to a former guest on the Canusa Sports Desk, Ryan Kellogg, who pitched a no-hitter last weekend for the Arizona State Sun Devils versus the Oregon State. Beavers in Oregon State, so uh, kudos to him, and hopefully he uh, keeps on dropping his ERA because right now it is under one, so quite impressive start to his collegiate career, but this week is a big week in Canada for the NHL trade deadline. We have these crazy hockey holidays. One is J July 1st for free agent signing. Is Another one is trade deadline day in Canada. 
we've been talking trade deadline for a good month here with the media system, but this week was a big trade to Jerome McGinley to the Pittsburgh Penguins. And also the interesting thing is that he was actually traded to Boston first. Jerome decides he's not going to go to Boston. So then Calgary manager Jay Feaster had to then get back on the phone and make a trade with Pittsburgh, taking a deal that wasn't as good as what Boston was offering him because uh, Jerome kind of decided at the last minute, you know, no, I'm not going to go to Boston, which is kind of, you know, bad for Jerome to pull because he did pull. Um, Jay Feaster did go to Jerome again and said, you know, we're going to trade you. Name uh, four teams you'd like to go to because he did have a no trade clause in his contract. Pittsburgh being one of them, Boston being another with Chicago and L.A. Feaster made the calls to those four teams, had the best deal with Boston in the last minute. You know, he'd renege. Do Marcus, what would you do in that situation if your, you know, GM came to you and said, you know, you, there's four teams, you have a no, no trade clause, and then you reneged on it. Was that right for the player to do and jeopardize the team taking a worse deal to make you happy? Um, I personally think that, you know, as you said, it, it kind of looks bad on the player. Um, I, I really don't know, you know, the, the whole outcome of everything, of, of the ins and outs of the NHL or how that works, but I know in, in uh, the NBA when guys – tend to renege on deals or back out, out of deals of having a, non, a, a no trade clause, you know, it, there's a little backlash that, that comes about. Uh, I've always been a guy that, uh, you know, to try to be about my word, um, try to focus on, you know, being, um, you know, as, as straight up and, and clean as possible. Um, that old situation, you know, it, 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 it's, it's making headway now where not, not so much in a positive situation. So, you know, hopefully, you know, the, the teams and, and the player both comes out, you know, where, where the deal is happy and uh, everything can move forward. But you always want to be the type of guy that uh, uh, that comes across as, as a trustworthy guy and a man of, of your word. So, like I said, hopefully, you know, in the end, everything uh, goes, goes through smoothly. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, again, they did put Feaster in a bad situation to try and quickly make a new deal with Pittsburgh. But one thing uh-huh. that has to be given to Feaster is you can't give him too much credit because both deals that he had, the one with Boston or the one with Pittsburgh, was not the best deal available. I don't know why he felt he needed to trade Jerome um, a, a week before the trade deadline. The de- trade deadline is April 3rd, so I would have kept him to the last minute. You know, bid these teams up against each other. Try to get the best you can. You're in a rebuilding stage. You're most likely not going to be the GM of the Calgary Flames next year after your horrendous idea of to sign Ryan O'Reilly and possibly losing your first round pick and the player and now not even getting any pure talent from Pittsburgh. So really, I don't think it was smart for him to move Jerome that early. Trade deadline is on Wednesday. And I think if I was Jay Feaster, I would have kept Jerome with with the Calgary Flames until Wednesday, until trying to get that last minute deal. Because I think that's when teams get the most buck for the player is when you keep it right the last minute because people do get, get desperate. And if you pin one team against another, you could get three or four prospects opposed to one or two. But like we said, so this weekend is trade deadline weekend. And I think there's still a lot of big names that possibly could be moved. Mika Kippersaw from Calgary has a mental no trade clause. You know, he doesn't have a no, no move clause in his deal, but he did tell any team that he will not report because he wants to finish his career in Calgary. You know, that's kind of a saga. We don't know if that's going to happen. Roberto Luongo could be traded. We've been hearing this ever since the summer. So there's a lot of big names that still need to be moved in the NHL. But I think it's going to be an exciting time because, you know, like Frank was saying, the dog days of the NBA is happening on. But now with the NHL, with this shortened season, everything's going on fast forward. With, you know, teams are playing every other night. Everyone's in a playoff race. So... And especially this year, I find that other than Pittsburgh, who they went out and they got Brendan Morrow this week, they got Doug Murray, they have Jerome, Jerome McGinley, they have pretty much stacked their team. And there's that rumor is, have they overstacked their team? You know, Have you ever been in that situation, Marcus, where there was a trade deadline and big names came in, but personalities then take over? You know, Do you think that too much personality or too much talent in a dressing room is harder to, to coach and to manage when there's less guys that are just grit and winning it because they're going out there, you know, giving 110%, or do you have to massage egos when there's too many, you know, good players on a well, team? There's, there's always, you know, a, a lot of um, 
you know, adversity that comes about when, when times of trade deadline happens. You know, you hear rumors. Guys are worried about, you know, where they're going to be, what's going to happen. I know I was uh, in, in the middle of a lot of trades, trade, trade rumors, you know, every year of my career in, in Chicago, but it never happened. So, you know, I know personally it, it takes a toll on you. And then when new guys come in, you don't know what the new role is going to be for, for yourself or what it's going to be for the new guys coming in. You never know what the guys, the new guys are, who the new guys are that's coming in, their personalities, uh, their strengths, their weaknesses. So it, it, it really, uh, sometimes it, it, it changes teams for the better. Sometimes it changes them for the worse. So you, you just have to try to approach it as a professional and uh, do the best you can. I, I, like I said, personally, at, at a young age, I really didn't know exactly what to do, how to handle it. Uh, we didn't have, you know, the... the the best amount of vets, you know, available to uh, show us the way. Uh, I, I think, you know, my rookie year, I was drafted with six or seven other rookies, and, you know, the, the veterans that were on the team before me was, you know, Ron Artest, uh, Corey Benjamin, and, and uh, Elvin Brand, and they were drafted the year before. I think the oldest guy on the team at the time was Fred Hoiberg, and he was 26. So, you know, to, to be so young, uh, then we had a lot of trades coming in back and forth. You know, we would just totally out of whack and you know uh it, it can cause a lot of problems uh in ways and in other ways it can it can help it just depends on you know how the organization goes from there that's one thing that fans need to uh, remember is that you know there are people's lives that are affected right. whenever these trades go in place you know it's always fun to you know treat these players like fantasy players and you know who are we going to trade here and there but not affecting you know the effects that they have on these on their personal life you know moving their family right. you know moving their kids out of school if that's the situation you know well, how they're going to manage that and it's always interesting to see kind of you know we as, as fans always think it's like oh well we'll just trade Marcus Pfizer for you know LeBron and D Wade and, and, and no problem you know just not affecting you know the personal lives that they have and that's something that fans need to kind of remember when trades go down and you know these players do have to think of their family in Jerome McGinley's case too right and what was best for his situation you know was Pittsburgh better for his family over Boston or what was the decision that made him you know pick one or the over the other absolutely are you guys ready for the rapid fire wrap-up I think we are good let's do it uh four questions gentlemen number one are you glad the Miami Heat lost and the streak is over Number two, thoughts of Tiger Woods, again, being the uh, number one golfer. Congratulations to Tiger, I guess. Uh, number three, from the teams remaining, who do you pick playing in the final four? <clears throat> Marquette. Uh, and what are you watching this week, Derek? <laughs> so I'm going to start. Um, I am glad the streak's over. Like I said, it was, just, it was getting overkill where, you know, just constant talk about the streak, who they're playing, how they did the game before. So I'm glad that's over and there's more focus on the other teams in the NBA. I am... Excited that Tiger Woods is back as a number one golfer. I felt, you know, it's exciting when he's up there. No other golfer has kind of taken charge after Tiger lost his reign as number one. So it's got to see him being back at number one. And I'm stu super stoked to see him at the Masters, see how he does there with his red shirt on Sunday. And my final four, I'm going to have Marquette, Ohio State, Michigan, and Louisville, and I'm going to keep with uh, my hopes of Louisville winning it all and Coach uh, Patino doing what he's done in the past with um, his other programs. Unfortunately, never really succeeded as an NBA coach. How about you? Oh, sorry, what am I watching this week? Take me up to the ball game. Season starts on Tuesday. Has not been... Uh, Play ball. <laughs> can't get here soon enough, so Jay season opener against Cleveland Tuesday. That's what I'll be watching. A lot of baseball. Getting my uh, summer sport fix in early. Marcus. Um, well, me, for myself, i not really happy that the streak is over. Like I said, I'm a guy that, that, that believes that records are meant to be broken, so I was looking forward to those guys at least getting one game uh, past the streak. Uh, but, you know, and like I said, I think it was something good that, that was for the NBA, and it was exciting to watch. Um, as far as Tigers being number one, that's, that's definitely great again. I, I personally feel like he's been – you know, just practicing for the last couple of years and just keeping us, you know, all on our toes, waiting to and wondering when he was going to be back on top. But we, I, I think, we all eventually knew that, you know, it wasn't going to take uh, that long for him to get back in, into his rare form. And you know, it's exciting to see him back there. Um, as far as, as my top pick to win the NCAA tournament, I, I really think uh, 
Louisville is going to pull it out. I think Coach Patino has those guys extremely focused. I, I love the way uh, Peyton Fievel, uh runs the ball club, and you know they're they're just in in the groove right now. And uh, what I'm watching on TV is Duck Dynasty. Uh, Andy, <laughs> one of my favorite shows in the world. Uh, I'm from Louisiana, from uh, Northern Louisiana. Those guys are from Monroe, Louisiana, about 30 miles away from my house. And and I'm looking forward to the off season, being able to go back home and and hopefully go down there and and, and hang out with the guys. I, I met Willie uh, Willie Robson, the CEO of the company, and everybody else was out of town at the at the moment. They were all on vacation, but. Uh, like I told my wife, I said, we have to come back. I, I got to see if this guy's size is real. I, I just do not believe he's a real character. I was he's, just going to say, so you know, Uncle Cy, you, know, you have to kind of, you know, does everyone have an Uncle Cy there in Louisiana? Because that to be a unique well, character. Everyone. I, I think I have a couple of Uncle Cy's in my family. But <laughs> it, 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 it's, a, it's a funny show. I absolutely watch each and every show over and over and over again like, you know, I've never seen them. Me and my me and my babies, we get in the bed and we just sit and we just watch. Even my four year old, we just sit and we just watch <laughs> and laugh. Like we've never seen the shows before. <laughs> you got any strong feelings about the uh, rest of the final four there, Marcus? Um, I, I, like I said, I'm just looking forward to you know great games. Um, I'm looking forward to watching. You don't care as long as it's you know Louisville at the end, no. right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 well, I'm not really personally cheering, cheering for, for Louisville, but they, they, they are the team that seems to be, you know, the most talented right. in in college basketball for me right now. Um, <clears throat> and just watching, you know, I've always been an admirer of Coach Tino and, um, you know, the things that he's done in his career, and I, I just think those guys are playing extremely well right now. Uh, Marcus, we're about ready to wrap up the show, but we like to uh, ask our guests to talk about what they're doing, you know, Facebook, Twitter, anywhere like that, or anywhere you might be in public if uh, the folks want to check you out, uh, what you got going out and about. Well, right now I'm, I'm, I'm in Las Vegas uh, training at Impact Sport, um, training to, to make this NBA comeback. I've, I've lost a ton of weight. I've, I've been, you know, training hard for the last uh, four, five, six weeks. Uh, and when I say a ton of weight, I mean I have to move this ton. You know, I've been trying to train on my own. Uh, things just wasn't, wasn't working out. Uh, my representation that I had wasn't doing anything for me. And um, I signed a new agent uh, a couple weeks back, Brian Brundage from uh, Northwest Indiana uh, with WCM. That's Worldwide Career Management. Uh, look it up, www.wcm.us. You know, he, he's doing a great job. He, not only in basketball, NBA, he has you know, football guys and uh, professional boxing, MMA. He's all around a uh, good guy. You know, the, the company is, is, is doing extremely well. You know, and he has uh, myself, uh, Lim McMorrow, and uh, Trent Tony Cop out here in Vegas with uh, uh, Joe Abunaso out here in uh, Impact Sports. And we've been out here for two and a half weeks. I've even lost six and a half, seven pounds since I've been here. I don't know uh, how you can lose they, weight in Vegas. I mean, there's food everywhere, you know. <laughs> but well, 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 what the all the power to you, know, Derek. Why don't you wrap yeah. it up? <laughs> so, Marcus, again, thank you for coming on. We look forward, um, and we expect you to come back when you do make your return to the NBA, because we know you're going to, and we expect you to have you back on after when you're in the NBA player. And also, I, um, I want that. everyone. Yeah, thank you for coming on. I want everyone to know that next week we have Kale Orge coming on. He played shortstop for Team Canada at the recent World Baseball Classic. He is the son of Garth Orge. He is a que that's a question that we normally get asked. And also, we just got confirmed that we have Kevin Sturlman on next week, who's actually yeah. preparing to play at the Masters at Augusta in a couple weeks. So those are two guests that we have next week on the show. So looking forward to them two coming on. Gotta go. It's the Canusa Sports Desk on the 405 Radio. If you are checking out the podcast on iTunes or on CanusaSD.com, come catch the live show every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern. That is uh, 8 a.m. Pacific right here on the 405 Radio. So we'll see you next